This is building a better New York for all. Um, and we have a, just an absolutely fantastic panel of uh, leaders in affordable housing uh, from the federal government, the state government, and city government. Uh, so let me just take uh, a little bit of time to introduce you to them. Um, probably you know them all because they're sort of shining lights in, in our industry. Um, we have Holly Light, uh, who is with HUD and is the uh, regional administrator for New Jersey and New York at, the, uh, at HUD. Um, and Holly has uh, uh, an absolutely, you know, distinguished career. Um, she was at HPD before and probably, and I get to say this, probably one of the, or is the best uh, deputy commissioner for development that we ever had. And, uh, uh, and, and I get to say that because, because I was one of those. That, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, just smart, uh, uh, great leadership, uh, and a get-it-done sort of attitude. And next to her, uh, he's lucky to be sitting uh, between two uh, fantastic housers um, here, Jamie Rubin, who is the newly appointed commissioner for um, HCR, the state's housing agency, housing and community renewal. Um, and we are uh, absolutely uh, thrilled to have him in that position um, for, for, for lots of different reasons. He's uh, smart, uh, aggressive, um, thoughtful, um, and, he, and he knows supportive housing. Uh, he's also the chair of the Common Ground Board of Directors, uh, so we're thrilled to have him both here, but more so in the position. Uh, next to him is Vicki Bean, someone who probably needs no introduction uh, to us. Vicki is one of the preeminent housers, uh, not only in New York, but uh, in the country. Um, we were grateful two years ago or 18 months ago when she agreed to uh, assume the helm of HPD, one of the preeminent uh, local housing agencies in the country, and to uh, lead the development of Mayor de Blasio's plan, which is thrilling and is uh, in full swing. Uh, now, prior to that, she was at the Furman Center um, and really was one of the, uh, along with her uh, associates there, one of the preeminent uh, thoughtful thought leaders uh, on housing and housing affordability. So we're grateful to, uh, definitely grateful to have her in, in her current position. Uh, Rich Froelich, um, who is uh, the Chief Operating Officer and uh, uh, counsel, General Counsel at HDC, and I think is one of the most brilliant finance, affordable housing finance minds uh, in, in, in the country. Um, and Rich, Rich has been at HDC for 14 years now? 12. 12, 12, 12 years. Oh. Uh, it just it just seems longer it for some reason, longer. Rich. Um, and you know, and Rich has uh, overseen program development and um, and 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 building up a very very strong HDC uh, so that it can finance uh, affordable housing and and being one of the real partners who have transformed HDC into a critical uh, component of the city's housing plan. Um, and next to uh, Rich, and uh, last but, but not least in terms of the introductions is Kathy Pennington, um, who is the Executive Vice President at NYCHA for Leased Housing. Um, and Kathy's been at NYCHA for two years um, and comes to us from Chicago um, and from the uh, Public Housing Agency in Chicago. Uh, she's uh, an amazing find for, for New York City. Um, and I uh, know through, just for, through her work, um, that she's a, an extraordinary advocate um, or helpmate with, in supportive housing, um, thinking about how to use Section 8 to really expand the availability of uh, of supportive housing uh, through project basing it, which has sort of become a critical component of, of and mainstay for the development of uh, supportive housing in New York. Um, 
and, uh, and, and in that regard, a real leader in our industry. So, uh, fantastic panel. And, I, and I, I should introduce, introduce myself, too. I'm uh, Bill Trailer uh, with Richmond Housing Resources and the chair of the Networks Board. Um, and uh, so, you know, with this, is, this panel is sort of focused on big picture, and we'll try to go from 5,000 feet down to at least 500 feet in terms of supportive housing. But we want to start with the big picture, where supportive housing fits in the broader um, market, and in the uh, broader context of affordable housing. So we want to sort of start with the main housing policy goals and objectives at each of the federal, state, and city agencies who are represented here and how those goals impact state and local activities. Um, we want to highlight um, how you guys are sort of collaborating together and working together. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, what I'd like to do is sort of take for each of you to take five minutes, um, and, and I'll be up taskmaster on time, or try to be, um, and, uh, and sort of let us know, um, or fill us in where your agencies are, and, and again, sort of how you're collaborating and working together. And we'll start with the, the top, with the federal government. Uh, so Holly, why don't, you, why don't you lead us off? Thank you, Bill. Um, so, Needless to say, the federal government's resources are not what they once were. Um, so I think one of the major themes uh, in the Obama administration at HUD has been figuring out how to uh, do more with less, the, uh, the old saw, um, and figuring out how to be smarter about our resources and find uh, synergies. So collaboration is certainly a critical uh, piece of that. Uh, I think one of the exciting changes, mindset changes that's occurred, and this really was led under um, the leadership of the former secretary, Sean Donovan, uh, who's well known to New Yorkers, uh, was kind of shifting more from just a strict housing view to a neighborhood view. Um, and a lot of our programs are reflective of that broader, more comprehensive approach. So uh, what was once hoped six, where you know, basically money was given to demolish and rebuild housing uh, and under a different model, uh, that morphed into choice neighborhoods. And choice neighborhoods is, is a planning process. There are planning grants that are given to um, public housing authorities and municipalities to not just plan the uh, reformation of that housing, but to really look at the full neighborhood, acknowledging that we are not going to tackle poverty um, just by building pretty or low-scale housing, but we have to really look at full neighborhoods. And so um, Choice and a number of other grants, um, Sustainable Communities, the Promise Zones, these are all programs that HUD has led and we partner with a lot of other federal agencies to work with localities in a very place-based manner uh, to look comprehensively at how you can transform neighborhoods and revitalize entire communities. Um, so that has been a big, a big focus of ours. We just, um, there have been a number of planning grants in New York and New Jersey, including here in New York City. Um, NYCHA got a Choice Neighborhoods planning grant for Mott Haven. I believe they now have an application in to try to get implementation money for that. Uh, we just got the first Promise Zone in Region 2, which is for Camden. Uh, what Promise Zone does to the point of doing more with less is we don't actually give anyone any money, but we have a really big announcement and we get really excited about it because what it does do <laughs> is it gives that municipality a leg up. They get actual bonus points on RFPs for 15 federal agencies' uh, resources, and that actually has made a huge difference. So this is the second round of Promise Zones. There were uh, five previously that within a year already um, had accrued $100 million of um, investment just leveraging um, that, that designation, which is uh, significant. Um, another big thing, and I think this so sort of goes along with the same uh, mindset of really looking comprehensively at places, has been how we've uh, responded to the Sandy recovery. Um, we, thanks to uh, the presidential task force that was created and that Sean Donovan led, um, and that Jamie led for New York City, um, there's, there was a real focus on doing disaster recovery smarter and better than 
say after Katrina, just as a random example. Um, and the result has been that we have a really great relationship between a regional Sandy team and the headquarters Sandy team, um, and we are doing things in a much more comprehensive, thoughtful way than I think we usually respond with our grant monitoring. Um, for better or for worse, as Jamie can attest, we are very involved at the region in working with the grantees. Uh, we did a international design competition called Rebuild by Design, and there are seven winning uh, infrastructure projects that are certainly more innovative than I think uh, federal government usually would come up with on its own, and those are being implemented now, and we're working very closely on those and other infrastructure projects. And the part that we're playing here in the region is harnessing these tens of federal agencies that are involved in permitting and approvals and other things and trying to help expedite that process by creating a framework so that the grantees can say, okay, we're ready to come to you uh, to review, get an early review before we start our EIS on a project, and we can sort of feed in some information early and hopefully, we will see, uh, make that process uh, both more comprehensive and looking at how federal funds are spent throughout the region by different agencies um, and also quicker. That is the goal. So um, a couple other things I'll, I'll touch on. Uh, ho ending homelessness is a huge Obama administration uh, priority. I think we'll talk about that a little more in detail later, but uh, the first step in that is uh, the commitment to end ho uh, veterans homelessness by the end of this year. We have hundreds of mayors that have signed on to the Mayor's Challenge to do this by the end of the year, including Mayor de Blasio. Um, and we, we are on track in most of those jurisdictions to do so. Um, and that has really been a big, big collaboration, both at the federal level, we've been working very closely with the VA and other federal agencies, but also with localities. Uh, one example is we've, uh, the VA has worked very closely with NYCHA because the VA is really on the front line of knowing who um, homeless veterans are. Um, and NYCHA ha has now hooked up with the VA so that the VA can give um, names to NYCHA to help expedite getting um, homeless veterans into housing in NYCHA. And that has worked quite well. Um, and finally, and I think uh, one of the things that we're uh, most excited about is really redefining how we work on public housing. Um, there's, uh, I think that we would all be sticking our head in the sand if we thought that Congress was suddenly going to fall in love with public housing as a uh, budgetary item. Uh, and so in, as a result of that knowledge, we are really working hard to think of creative ways to preserve public housing. Um, and one of those is the rental assistance demonstration and a, a program that uh, we are still in the pilot phase of around the country, but it is working really well and bringing, uh, leveraging a Section 8 contract uh, in order to bring private investment into public housing authorities around the country. Um, and along that same line, I would say the other things, choice neighborhoods is another way that we're looking at public housing differently. And uh, Secretary Castro, our current secretary, is very, very dedicated to bringing broadband into public housing authorities everywhere in the country. And that is another uh, big push that we are doing now, and uh, we're working with NYCHA on that as well. So I will leave it at that, and we can get into more details later. Great, thanks. And Jamie. Thanks, Bill. Um, okay, so a couple of things. Um, um, first of all, uh, I'm, thank you for having me here on short notice. Um, I actually, just for the sort of clarification, I actually have not even started my job yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> although there's, I cannot get anybody yet to tell me whether I am in fact commissioner or not. There is, <laughs> there is, a, there is a commissioner. He's sitting in his office. I met with him yesterday. I spent an hour with him yesterday. Um, and I mean, there's no question there's a commissioner. On the other hand, um, there was a press release last week that said I was appointed commissioner and I don't have to be confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to government. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, and if you'd like me to leave at this point, I'm no. more than happy to. Okay, so um, a couple of things just quickly. First of all, obviously, because I've been in a different job that I'll talk about in a second um, for the last two years and, and come from a whole different world before that. Um, I can't do what, um, what a year from now hopefully I will be able to do, which is talk in extensive detail and with great pride about all the work that our agency has done over the prior year and years um, to address a lot of the issues that you all are here to talk about today. Um, I have you know, a raft of briefing materials and I've got numbers in front of me um, and so I, could, I, can, you know, I can do that. 
Um, but frankly, I'm not a big fan of taking credit for work that other people did. And a lot of the people that did all that work, I see in the audience, like Brett Garwood over there, and I saw Ted somewhere, and there's lots of other HCR employees here who have done spectacular work over the last um, four plus years um, to accomplish everything that HCR has accomplished. So I'm, I'm going to apologize to them for not sitting up here and sort of try to one-up everybody else. Um, you have to sort of take it for granted that I understand what you've done. I think everybody else does, too. It's been record year, uh, two or three years running, something like that, for just the production of affordable housing units. Um, the production of supportive housing units has been equally impressive. The governor's commitments um, through House New York, uh, continued support of New York, New York 3, et cetera, that we'll talk about later, um, I think stands, uh, stands by itself as a commitment, his, as a symbol of what he um, what he thinks about the field, both the affordable housing field and the supportive housing field, and many of the issues um, that Holly that Holly referred to. So um, I'll come back next year and do that in greater detail. But I thought what it be, might be more interesting for me to do, rather than simply um, pretend that I did something I didn't do, um, is tell you a little bit about what I've been doing, some of the lessons that I've learned from there, and then tell you perhaps um, at T minus 10, I guess it is at this point, um, what I think you might um, expect from the years to come when I actually figure out um, what I'm doing. Um, so uh, what have I been doing? I've been running the governor's office of storm recovery. Holly referred to that. We have a great partnership with HUD. Um, we work very closely with the city's own efforts. It's um, the office that was established uh, to manage the city, the state's four and a half billion dollar community development block grant allocation after Sandy. It's for actually for Sandy, Irene, and Lee. Um, nothing really existed in the state bureaucracy to handle <coughs> a, a grant of that magnitude for a storm that looked like that. And so the governor set it up um, inside of HCR as a subsidiary of the Housing Trust Finance Corporation. Um, so actually I um, have been an employee of HCR for the last two years. I didn't really realize that, but I have been. Um, and, uh, and we were, I was hired in uh, August of 2013 to run that effort. I came from, as Holly said, working for Sean Donovan on the Federal Task Force on Sandy. I think we're gonna have a competition to see how many times we can invoke the name of Sean Donovan <laughs> in, this, in this day. I'm going for 10, what do you, what do you think? Oh, I can beat you. You easy. can beat me, all right, fine. Um, uh, so I worked for Sean, who was an old friend of mine, for about 10 months helping set up that task force, and I came from private equity uh, for many years before that. Um, uh, so the, the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery manages that $4.5 billion. We've programmed it. Uh, it's all under our control. We have really uh, a remarkable amount of basically complete discretion over it. We don't go through the Department of Budget of the state or anything else. Um, and we have at this point spent about a billion and a half in the last really year and a half on programs that range from um, repair and rehabilitation of, uh, of damaged single-family, multifamily homes out in Long Island and upstate. We don't work in New York City on, on housing. Um, uh, we have a very aggressive buyout and acquisition program where we buy, um, again, single family homes in floodplains that were substantially damaged by one of the storms um, and then either reduce them down to a wetland where they'll remain um, as protective infrastructure forever or we resell them. We had our first auction actually of state owned properties a couple weeks ago and generated about 57 cents on the dollar um, uh, from what we spent to buy the homes, which is terrific. We'll just plow that back into additional programs. Um, we invest in statewide infrastructure. We also manage a billion dollar FEMA fund for mitigation infrastructure. Um, we have a small business grant program and then we have something called the Community Reconstruction Program which I'll talk about um, uh, later. It's very much I think relevant to what Holly said about um, Secretary Castro and Secretary Donovan's, that's two, um, <laughs> commitment to, uh, to improving neighborhoods not just focusing on housing. Um, that's, that really is what the Community Reconstruction Program uh, is about. Um, so it's been an interesting experience. It's been uh, an immersion in government. Um, <coughs> and I think I've, uh, there's a few things that I would say I have learned from that. There's a lot of things I've learned um, that are absolutely going to be applicable to what, uh, what I do when I get over to HCR in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, one is... Um, uh, bureaucracy, everybody talks about needing to untangle bureaucracy, and I'm not, um, I think I have a pretty realistic sense of what you can really do. But the fact is that there have been a number of occasions, and some of them involve, let's say, um, a federal agency, where, um, where we have decided first on what we thought our policy should be. So we had four and a half billion dollars, and we knew where we had to get to, which was we had to fix 20,000 homes in a very short period of time. Um, so we decided on what our policy ought to be and how we thought that we ought to get there, what the right way to get there was. And then 
backtracked and tried to figure out um, what the legal or regulatory impediments might be, or I should say structures that governed our activity might be. Um, and we very quickly figured out that while we wanted to do things that seemed like they were the right thing to do and we were sometimes told that we couldn't do them because you can't do them that way, when I had some smart young lawyers look at why it was that we couldn't do them that way, it turned out that in fact either there was, no thing, there was nothing written down anywhere, which is that's what matters in the law, there was nothing written down that said you couldn't do it some particular way or sometimes even more embarrassingly, um, we had made up our own rules. Um, and we're simply following our own rules. We're basically following our tails in a circle um, and walking ourselves down a rat hole. So we have managed, I think, to untangle a number of those. I'm not going to go into giving any examples, but by either by sort of just doing something um, or forming, building up our partnership with, with Holly and her colleagues at HUD to help explain to them why we thought that we had a, perhaps a somewhat better answer and there really wasn't any reason not to do what we thought. Um, I am going to guess knowing nothing, that I'm going to find examples of opportunities to do that kind of untangling um, when I get to HCR. And again, it's not because um, people that work at HCR um, are, um, you know, uh, ill will. Have, there's no ill will there. There's no, obviously, desire to create or, or, or adhere to some meaningless set of rules. It's just that sometimes it takes a set of fresh eyes, I think. Um, to ask why it is you're doing something some way. And by the way, having spent some time getting briefed up in the last couple months, I know that the folks who are there now are already doing that kind of thing, which is why they've had such a couple of good years. The governor is not a big fan of bureaucracy, um, as you may have known. So anyway, I'm looking forward to trying to do that, um, kind of untangling. Um, you know, along the same lines, I think a focus on execution, that's again something I think we've adhered to at, at uh, GOSR. It's probably the single best lesson that I bring to this from my time in private equity. Um, there's other lessons that really um, probably are less positive, but this is a good one. Um, you know, focus on execution. I think Holly, I echo what Holly said about the lack of additional financial resources. Everybody wants more money, um, and I've been blessed in this job with a lot of resources, but the fact is you very quickly figure out that more money is not really the solution always. Um, a lot of times you have more money and you can spend it um, in ways, it doesn't, the, the an, an, un, a, um, uh, unlimited resources don't, don't force you to uh, look at how you're actually doing things. And so we have operated within our budget, um, despite the fact that we have a ton of money at, uh, at Storm Recovery, um, and have acted as if we don't have a ton of money and acted as if we have to go back to ask for more every time we want to do something. And I think that's a, a discipline that's going to serve us well at HCR. So we're going to be looking very carefully at how we do things, how we maximize the resources that we have. The last thing I would say, and this is where I will stop, um, is uh, you talked about collaboration. We are, um, I think the, I will say this, um, I think at GOSER we are the best example of government collaboration that I've seen so far because that is basically what we were set up to do is to be the governor's point person for the recovery of the state from this major catastrophe, this multi tens of billions of dollars catastrophe uh, that was Sandy. Um, we've had to work with basically every state department in some way, whether we give them money, which we're perfectly happy to do, or we get from them cooperation in some area. And we've become very, very good at measuring how we do in that collaboration and what we get back. Um, I would say that um, you know there's all kinds of other collaboration that we're invested in, the federal government and the city government, whatever, but the first point of contact has to be, the first way we should be measured is do we, measure, do we collaborate with our own state agencies? Um, and I already can think of several ways that we should be doing that. Um, when I get to HCR, there's many agencies that we work with. Um, I'm gonna make sure that we're doing that as well as we possibly can. Um, certainly the area of homeless policies is the most obvious one because um, solving that is something that requires all the agencies to get together. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I look forward to working with all of you and to hearing what else you have to say. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Vicki. So good morning, everyone, and thank you um, for being here. And I, let me just start out by saying that it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to, um, to be on this panel and indeed to, to be working with all of the folks up here. Uh, we couldn't have a better partner in Washington than, uh, than Holly. She brings uh, so much knowledge of the city, but also just incredible smarts and, and uh, charm. Uh, Holly can get anybody to do anything, I think, um, <laughs> be, uh, because of her amazing charm. Um, and, uh, and just uh, you know, an incredible partner uh, at HUD. And uh, at HPD, we've, because we too are involved in the storm recovery efforts, we've had um, a great chance to work with Jamie and his team. 
and really benefited enormously from his creativity and ability to cut through the cut through the brush and and get things done. So we're really looking forward to working with you in this new uh, way as, as well. Um, so as Bill mentioned, it's been a little more than a year since um, the mayor came out with his Housing New York plan, which committed the city to build or preserve 200,000 units of housing. And I want to, um, those numbers are, are big and they, um, they wake me up at night. Um, but, um, but I think more importantly is really to focus on, well, what are we trying to achieve? What are those numbers trying to achieve? And I, I want to focus on uh, three core pillars that, that relate to our conversation uh, today. The first is that we are really trying to broaden the range of people that we serve through that housing. So we're trying very hard to push our the AMI targets down to 40 and 50 percent, where they've traditionally been 60 percent, and also to push them up so that we're providing some housing for the bus drivers, the sanitation workers, the nurses um, that are so <laughs> vital to, to our city. Um, we're also um, trying to do that in a way that creates more mixed income housing so that you've got a range of incomes within the very same building, uh, much less within the very same neighborhood. The second core goal that, um, that we have is, is that we recognize that everyone deserves to live in dignity and we need to meet the special housing needs of the elderly, people with physical disabilities, people with other special needs that affect the kinds of housing and the kinds of services that they need. We are strongly committed to providing permanent housing for the homeless, uh, for the city's homeless uh, population, a key priority of, of this administration and I know also of, of the governor. And a mission, of course, that we share with so many people in the room. And third, and this really goes back to, uh, to what Holly was saying about HUD changing its focus from just buildings to, to neighborhoods, is that we believe that quality housing is a catalyst, it's an anchor for a neighborhood, um, but it doesn't just turn the, that family's fortunes around, it also stabilizes and anchors and turns a neighborhood's fortunes around. So we're committed, um, and the housing plan committed, the city agencies to really work together in a much more holistic neighborhood planning, comprehensive planning, um, way to build neighborhoods and not, not just housing. So, so let me talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done along those three um, missions that I think are of particular interest to, to the folks in this room. Um, first, we made across the board changes to our existing new construction and preservation uh, programs so that we could stretch our dollars further um, and better leverage any other resources um, out there, including, of course, private financing uh, resources, but also so that we could do much more of a mixed income approach within our buildings and, and serve that range of incomes uh, within the same building. At the same time, we introduced several new programs that are really aimed at those extremely low and low income families. So we introduced what we call our ELLA program, our Extremely Low and Low Income Affordability Program, that requires 40% of the units in a project uh, to be affordable to very low income households, those 40, 50 uh, uh, percent of AMI. Second, we've made a lot of changes to our supportive housing programs. Um, several years ago, as you all know better even than I, using tax exempt bonds on supportive housing was considered a new frontier in innovative financing. Um, and of course we have our amazing partners at HDC to, to thank for, for advances there. Um, but, but now, thanks to the work of HDC and of course HFA, that's now standard. And we've released new term sh sheets this year that bring even more mainstream funding sources into the supportive housing uh, world using private debt and increasingly supportive housing is financed just like any other kind of affordable housing. And that brings in new resources, new partners, and also evens out the developer fees between affordable housing and supportive housing. We also created a new program for seniors, our SARA program, uh, Senior Affordable Rental <coughs> Apartments, um, to provide financing for the construction and renovation of affordable housing for very low income seniors. And we're piloting with um, our DHS uh, the home stretch model that many of you in the room have been involved in. 
that incorporates both shelter units and permanently affordable housing in the same uh, project. And we're very excited because we are looking to close the first project under that home stretch program uh, this month. In our asset management division, we've consolidated homeless re-rentals and we've created a new homeless placements uh, services units to expedite placements in, the, in some of the ways that Holly was talking about for veterans. We're using many of those techniques to really um, try to get the home, our homeless families placed faster and uh, reduce that homelessness uh, census. We've issued 500 vouchers towards uh, the mayor's initiative to move families out of shelters into permanent housing, and we're grateful to HUD for those vouchers, and we're grateful for the ability to target those to our homeless families. And then in that third area of sort of comprehensive neighborhood uh, planning, we formed a new unit, an Office of Neighborhood Strategies, to really signal how important we were taking neighborhoods and how important we thought the comprehensive planning uh, was. We formed within that division uh, an Office of, of Community Partnerships to work more closely with communities that we are working with to rezone, to provide additional opportunities for, uh, for new building, and to really bring all of the knowledge about neighborhoods that we have in our code enforcement, in our research, and, and bring it all together and, and focus it in on doing really good comprehensive uh, planning along with the communities in, in those neighborhoods. Um, so all of those things uh, are certainly um, things that we're very uh, proud of in this first year, but we are uh, ramping up even further for, uh, for this next year. We're very excited about uh, HUD's recent expansion of RAD, and we're, we're working, um, uh, we think that's gonna be a critical tool to preserving and renovating uh, supportive housing and, um, and are really looking forward to working with them there. We are looking forward to working with the state um, on the supportive housing commitments, partnering with HFA and, and of course DHCR, um, and are pleased that, that the governor um, uh, made an initial commitment to fund the 5,000 supportive housing units across the state uh, back in, I guess it was January, and, uh, and hope that we'll see even more of that going forward. We, as, as you know, we'd like to see uh, 12,000 units um, building on the success of New York, New York 3, and, and hope to see the, the supportive model uh, continued. Uh, we're obviously working hard in Albany um, on all kinds of things, um, and uh, of course, uh, preserving rent regulation, strengthening and preserving rent regulation because it is so critical to the stability of so many of our neighborhoods and such a critical source of housing uh, for so many of our low-income uh, families. We're also working to reform and make much more effective our 421A program so that we can build more affordable housing um, with those uh, dollars. And so those are some of the key things that we have been working on and will be working on, and I look forward to uh, working with so many of the great partners that we have up here and, and around the room, so thanks. Great, thanks Vicki. Um, and just, uh, you know, Vicki has to go to the city council at exactly 12 noon today, so she's gonna probably drop out before we finish, and so don't take offense, for, it's not because of any of your questions or, or anything else, it's that she needs to be drilled and punished by the yeah, city council. I'm so looking forward to the questions right. down there. Yeah. Uh, Rich, please. Um, thank you, and, and, and actually I have to thank you, Bill, for what I would call a Mark Yard-like introduction. <laughs> I mean, no one does it quite like Mark, except Bill is getting up there, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, I'm gonna talk a bit more about money. Um, uh, it's sort of what I do now, um, and it's sort of the secret to our success. Um, the amount of resources that we're able to put towards affordable housing is what really marks New York different than anywhere else in the country. Um, and, and so the scope and scale of what we do, that we have so many projects that we're all working on at different points in time, is because of the resources that we use and that we dedicate to affordable housing. Um, when you put it together, and it, it's sort of, it's, it's fascinating, um, one of the real important sources of soft money for the nation is the home program. And unfortunately, and, and Holly kind of pointed out that the resources that are available from Congress for housing keep on getting shrunk. 
Um, that's about 900 million, uh, if, or maybe less, depending on what happens um, this year. And um, in, in, the, in our next fiscal year, the combined uh, capital contribution that is expected from HDC and HPD, more importantly, will be about 900 million. So it just gives you an idea, we're spending close to the national budget on the soft money that makes affordable housing work. So, um, so, so money does matter, obviously, and, and our ability to do that. And, and that is a lot of our success. That and the great partners and the people uh, with, you know, who are creative and imaginative in how we use these different resources. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing uh, that's sort of exciting right now, and it, and it picks up on the things we keep on hearing that term neighborhood, uh, is that we're coming out, we're recharacterizing most of our bond issuance starting in June as sustainable neighborhood bonds. And, and what this means is some of you may have heard of something called green bonds, which are meant to be environmentally sensitive or relating to projects that have an environmental impact. Um, and what we're doing is working from that theme. A lot of our work uses the enterprise green standards, but going beyond that, recognizing that affordable housing is critical to creating um, economic diversity, creating opportunity, and creating the city that we want and the neighborhoods that we believe that we deserve and, and we need. So uh, we are recharacterizing our bonds this way, and this is um, something that we think will bring more attention to what we do, bring in new investors, people who are interested in social, social impact, um, and, and neighborhood um, support, and green, and trying to bring that all together. And so we're very excited about that. Um, it's exciting to be here at a network event. Um, you know, it used to be that uh, the bond world was sort of alien, and, and I think um, uh, several people have picked up on that, that we are now much more integrated, HDC is, in, in what a lot of the groups who come to uh, the network and that we're not this sort of weird thing. Bonds are, they're hard, they're complicated, they're too big, and so we don't get involved in that. In fact, it's such a great resource and, and a tool to be able to do more affordable housing, to do supportive housing, and to deal with a lot of the issues. And, and there are challenges to doing it, but we really continue to work through that. And that's been you know, tremendously important to us, and, and I think we'll talk some more about that in a little bit, about uh, the combining of shelter and, and trying to see how we can help in doing the work that so many of you are interested in doing. We are facing some challenges. Um, part of the success of New York as a whole and the growth of New York is uh, the population growth um, and the rent growth and, and it, it, it's, a, it's a scary time uh, and it, it's a, a little bit, uh, people are fearful about what's going to go on and they're hearing about land prices and as we talk about rezoning and doing different things in different neighborhoods, we're seeing this you know, <coughs> rapid growth in land. Uh, I saw a little posting today in my email, uh, a, a piece of land in Mott Haven that uh, sold for $54 a square foot. Now, it's not a crazy price, but it's high. Um, often, it used to be thought that most of the land in the Bronx wasn't really valuable without significant um, subsidy coming in. And so it's an interesting thing to see, and it's a challenge that we are definitely facing. New York is extremely hot. The, mar the real estate markets are extremely hot, and it makes it very hard uh, for us to do what we're doing. The great news is, is that we have a, a really large pipeline and that we have a lot of projects that are moving forward. We've seen great success in the first year of Housing New York. Um, we're expecting to have a record-breaking June, uh, lots of issuance, lots of new construction as well as preservation, um, and we really are shifting more to that. As Vicki pointed out, um, the ELLA program has started off strong. And, and that is a really important thing, a, a shift in our approach to being able to serve lower income people um, and to recognize that. Um, and, and that brings probably um, one of the things, the collaboration points that Bill had suggested. Talk about how you all work together. And we do, we work together very well, um, both with the federal government and the state. Without the state's support, um, we really have a hard time functioning. In particular, the volume cap which allows us to issue tax exempt bonds and get the 4% LIHTC comes mostly from uh, an allocation from the state. And so we work with the, the governor's office and, and the folks at HCR who are tremendously supportive of our efforts to do that. Um, and it's just a critical thing. New York is the only place in the country that is really using its volume cap at this level. We essentially use all of our volume cap. 
And, and so in that, it, it becomes a real challenge. And we've been able to be creative with the state. We came up with new structures. We came up with recycled bonds, which allows us to reuse bonds for projects that don't need LIHTC. We came up with a bifurcated structure, which allows us to do um, finance only the low income portions of the mixed income deals. And in doing that, we can extend the volume cap so that we can do more deals. And the reason why it's just so important is we created 725 million of tax credit equity in our deals last year because of volume cap. And that's only the HDC deals. It has nothing to do with what HFA did as well. So it gives you a sense of the amount of money that can come in. It's obviously, it's a critical part of RAD if we're gonna be able to do more, more transactions like that. It'll be critical for a lot of the work we do with NYCHA where we really created a much uh, bigger partnership over the years <coughs> to be able to help them and transform projects and bring more resources to NYCHA. So it, it is this inter interrelationship. The other part is um, something that if we can get out of the federal government will be tremendously important, and that is income averaging. And that is the ability to be able to do the mixing that Vicky said is so important, to be able to have middle, moderate income, not even middle income, people at 80% AMI, as well as people at, at 30 and 40% AMI. By being able to kind of cross that together so that they um, basically support each other, we create stronger neighborhoods, better projects, and just, it just, it, it'd be a great solution and would allow us to lever even more resources. So it's all about that levering. I always joke about it when I'm in a room with HUD. It's that our job is to lever the few resources that you give us as far as we can. Um, I mean it in the nicest way possible. Um, but it's in doing that that we can extend this and do more. And that's what it's all about. We want more. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Uh, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. So um, today I'm going to focus on um, our big picture, which is Next Generation NYCHA. It was recently published um, and kicked off with uh, Mayor de Blasio and our chair, Shola Olatoye, who I'm filling in for today, who is happily home with her new baby daughter. So we miss her, mm -hmm. but um, I'm going to do my best to fill her shoes. You want to post a picture? So I kind of <laughs> no pictures. Very beautiful. And awesome. So I kind of want to put um, the next generation NYCHA in this context. NYCHA's importance to the city lies not only in its sheer size, but in, in its deep affordability for New Yorkers. The average NYCHA household brings home an annual income of $23,000. For these families, the authorities guarantee that no rent payment will ever exceed 30% of a family's income. The threshold for a truly affordable housing is essential. NYCHA's 178,000 units include more than half of all the apartments in New York City with an asking rent of under $800 per month, and nearly three quarters of those under $500 per month. In a city with a private housing market, where in 2014 the median asking rent for an apartment was over $2,840, you can understand why there are 200,000 low and moderate income New Yorkers on our waiting <coughs> list for public housing, and another 130,000 on our waiting list for Section 8 subsidy. So I share those kind of facts with you to kind of put the next generation NYCHA into the context of how we have developed um, a plan to both preserve and develop uh, affordable housing. The plan, which is published at our website, I really encourage you all to go to the plan. It is very, very detailed, and it is not a theoretical feel-good plan. It is very detailed. It has very specific goals with metrics attached to it. So I'm just gonna share with you a couple of them and then I'll spend a little time on some of the development areas you may be interested in. So our plan exists on, is built on four um, fundamental goals and all those goals then have specific strategies attached. So the four major goals are to achieve short-term financial stability and diversify funding for the long-term. And I don't need to really elaborate as we all kind of touched upon the shrinking federal investment in affordable housing, particularly public housing. Um, we need to position ourselves to, to uh, fund ourselves differently. Operate as an efficient and effective landlord. 
rebuild, expand, and preserve public and affordable housing stock, and develop best-in-class resident services and resident engagement models. So I'm just going to touch upon a few of the strategies, and then I'll share some of our goals or some of our other um, uh, building goals that are moving forward as we speak. So on the short-term financial stability, uh, one strategy was to secure relief from the annual pilot fees, uh, improve resident rent and fee collection, and maximize the revenue and uses of NYCHA's ground floor spaces. Uh, in the arena of operating as an efficient and effective landlord, we are moving to a management model that will localize decision making at the property level versus a centralized management model. This we believe will enable our managers to make decisions more attuned to and, and responsive to their particular property needs. The cookie cutter approach really doesn't work. Uh, pursue a comprehensive sustainability agenda, which is all already, as a strategy, it's already in motion. It's been kicked off, which is our recycling program at all NYCHA properties. Under rebuild and expand um, housing, we are in the process of devising a capital planning strategy to address portfolio-wide needs, to provide underutilized NYCHA-owned land to support the creation of affordable housing units, and to leverage HUD programs to preserve housing. In our best in class um, on resident services and resident engagement models, we plan to transition from direct service provision to a partnership-based model and transform resident engagement and to attract philanthropic dollars for resident services through the creation of a nonprofit 501c3. And these few um, strategies that I've mentioned are already off the ground. Some of them are already at implementation stages. So I think you'll get the sense of, of how aggressive we're be, we are being. So I'm just going to touch, um, <coughs> I, I thought this audience would be interested in the expand and preserve um, affordable housing. So I just wanted to highlight a few strategies there. So um, NYCHA will seek capital support from the city and state to fund a vital roof replacement program which apparently has been in the news a lot lady, <laughs> lately. <laughs> so that is the $100 million per year for the next three years that calls on the state and city to match. And we have some uh, commitments in play. And this is to, um, this $100 million is really a roof replacement uh, program addressing one of the primary causes of mold. Um, the city's first $100 million will be spent on replacing roofs at 66 buildings um, and will affect nearly 13,000 um, residents. Another strategy is to adopt a new capital planning strategy to prioritize repairs and upgrades across its portfolio. The annual capital funding through HUD is about $300 million per year, which represents a small fraction of the $16.9 billion in unmet capital needs. So again, that, that divesting of, of funding is, you can see how critical. NYCHA will contribute resources to Housing New York, the mayor's plan to secure 200,000 affordable apartments by 2025. 20, uh, we will provide, so towards that goal, we will provide underutilized land for the creation of 10,000 new affordable housing units, including a mix of uses to provide a, additional amenities. And this is 10,000 units over 10 years. Explore opportunities to deliver building improvements and community amenities. Um, so, specifically what's on the agenda um, as we speak, NYCHA has been approved to convert 1,400 units at Ocean Bay Apartments uh, through a RAD conversion. There will be an RFP out uh, hopefully this month on that um, redevelopment project. Uh, Bayside, of course, is in uh, Far Rockaway. Um, subject to HUD approval, HUD partner, NYCHA will more aggressively pursue federal subsidy, including Section 8, for its 5,000 un unsubsidized units. We refer, many people refer to these as city-state units. Um, we call them LLC units, but we uh, have converted uh, thousands of those units to the Section 8 program, but there still remain 5,000 that have no subsidy at all. And so in order to, again, sustain those properties into the future, we really need to bring more rent subsidy into those properties. So we'll be looking at a variety of strategies 
to get subsidy into those properties. And then over 10 years, NYCHA could convert an additional 6,380 public housing units in scattered site development. So amongst this vast portfolio of primarily high-rise properties, we also have a smaller portfo portfolio of scattered site small buildings that we are reevaluating um, whether they would be good candidates for something like a RAD conversion. Um, and over 10 years, NYCHA could convert 8,313 public housing units in properties where the cost of re rehabilitation exceeds the cost of new construction, also deemed as obsolete units. So you'll see that these development goals are very um, diverse, both around preservation, uh, replacement, and, and building new. Needless to say, our development um, friends at uh, NYCHA are very, very busy, and again, partnering with everybody here at the table. Um, so I will close with encouraging you to go to our website to see our extensive plan, because I just gave you very high level about where we are headed to both preserve and uh, build new affordable housing in New York. Thank you, Kathy. There's, uh, as you can tell, there's so much going on, and there's a lot of, in, you know, information packed into a very little bit of uh, a time that I've sort of given folks to sort of talk about it. There's a uh, one theme that sort of I think has repeatedly come up among the folks is about neighborhood and place, and that place or where you live matters sort of critically. Uh, and there was just recently, HUD came out with a review of the Housing Choice Program showing that uh, folks who were able to move into better neighborhoods to take their rent subsidies and allow them to move into better neighborhoods uh, did phenomenally better um, on a, in a longitudinal study, and in particular, the, the kids did a lot better. Um, I wonder if uh, we could take a few minutes each, you know, one or two minutes each, Holly, Jamie, maybe, and Vicki, uh, the sort of comment on that, sort of what your thoughts are on that, um, uh, sort of the lead us off in a discussion. Sure. Um, I, mean, I think the results are a little more nuanced in that it depends on the age of the kids when they move, and the younger they are, the more impact and it still seems potentially no significant impact on adults if it, as they move over. But big picture, I think this is, to me, probably the most complicated policy issue that I've encountered um, at HUD. Um, and actually, Vicki and I have spent many breakfasts talking about these issues. Um, it is, to me, a huge trade-off, especially in a place like New York, where it is so expensive to provide affordable housing in uh, what is described in this study as uh, low poverty, high opportunity neighborhoods. Um, I, I think that uh, what HUD is trying to do is kind of balance dual approaches. One, which would be to provide tenants uh, with vouchers where they can go move into any neighborhood that they select. Um, as well as through programs like Choice Neighborhoods, trying to tackle uh, neighborhoods that are the most challenged and try to improve those for everyone who's living there. I think if we look at this as um, a, a single approach and sell out these neighborhoods that have been struggling, that isn't going to be a good answer for anybody either. And at the end of the day, subsidies and federal resources and local and state resources are going to be finite. And so for if we're putting extra subsidy in uh, to enabling voucher holders to go to very high rent neighborhoods, that is going to limit ultimately the number of people that we can serve. And I think these are not easy trade-offs and not easy policies to to say there is one approach and this is going to be the most successful in getting the most people out of poverty. Um, I do not feel like I am smart enough to know the answer to that yet. So uh, maybe I never will be, but I think it is a really, really complicated question. Vicki or Jamie? Um, so I'll, I'll, again, I'll be brief. I, um, I basically agree with what Holly said. I did have the chance to read, thank you. I had the chance to, I wouldn't say I read, but read, uh, look through. Um, not only the Harvard study, um, you know, th there were two Harvard studies, as it turned out. Um, so I have some sense of what they uh, what they found, and I agree with Holly that the findings were very nuanced. 
Um, and the danger, of, the danger, obviously, of things like that is that um, you know nobody uh, nobody takes the time anymore to get into nuance, and so you have some. I think there's a real risk in, in with with um, particularly when something comes out with a lot of fanfare after a long time, like the NPO study did, that policymakers will immediately jump to some conclusion and blow, as Holly said, scarce resources, running in a direction that maybe is not so. Um, you know, it's not so clear what the right answer is. Absolutely, there's, I mean, it's not like we should get rid of the House of Choice program. I mean, clearly you want to you have room for, um, you want to have room for subsidy to move people out of low income, low opportunity neighborhoods into better ones, but that's not the only answer. I, I mentioned before the community reconstruction program that we run um, at Storm Recovery, and I think it, it's actually relevant for this discussion. It's a $700 million um, program that we've, uh, that we put together across the state um, and uh, it's very much community driven. We put together local you know, work groups of, um, of local stakeholders, asked, gave them some assistance in making some, uh, doing some very detailed planning over a number of months, um, and then committed to fund some of the projects that they came out with. And very, for the most part, very, very local, very, very small scale, relatively speaking, <coughs> infrastructure and sometimes social infrastructure, hard infrastructure and social infrastructure. Uh, projects that were designed to increase the resilience um, of their their neighborhoods, and in some cases, the neighborhoods. Some of the communities were quite large. So, for example, Staten Island is one of our communities, um, but we've also got very very small towns up in the far north of New York State, and then some um, in New York City that are uh, areas defined by a number of blocks. So it was a sort of all kinds, all sizes, very variable um, in size program. And what we found is that. Um, by engaging, the, the really interesting outcome was not that people had ideas. They, everybody's got ideas. We were surprised by the, uh, our ability to get very, very disparate groups within one community to work together once we sort of forced them into a room more than once. I think if people think you're not serious about something, the government's not serious about something and not willing to fund something, um, they will very quickly dismiss it and fall into their old patterns of conflict. Um, and we had a lot of discussions with the governor about this very early on, about how to, how to establish their communities. What we decided to do was um, use data to determine where we should put our resources, um, and then build community groups and, and, and build the, the sort of the governance around that, and take a chance that we could get people to work together who perhaps hadn't worked together that well in the past, and it's worked quite well. And what it's enabled us to do is invest in the communities as opposed to um, giving people an opportunity to move other places. We've done the same thing with our buyout program where we've given people incentives to sell their homes to us but stay within their existing communities. And I think it's all sort of the same theme that you're talking about. Is how do we invest in communities that are perhaps, in our case, at risk, but get them to invest in finding ways to protect themselves against future risk rather than give up on the, in an individual community, let people move out, destroy the tax base and whatever else, and start this sort of ball rolling downhill where we end up dispersing people across other places. And I think it's a sort of at least an analog for what you're talking about yeah. with, um, with housing choice. Yeah. Uh, Vicki, do you? Yeah, um, I mean, it is a very difficult and complicated question that uh, Holly and I have not solved at breakfast. Maybe <laughs> maybe if we took it to you know, cocktails, we'd do better. But, um, but it, is a, it, it is certainly a very difficult uh, question because there are trade-offs in um, uh, building in higher op what are called higher opportunity neighborhoods is certainly more expensive. Um, and, uh, and certainly you can't leave behind uh, uh, other neighborhoods. So in the housing plan, we've taken a very um, concerted uh, two-prong approach of really trying through our neighborhood uh, planning exercises and, uh, and our um, investments in many neighborhoods across the city to shore up neighborhoods that are now lagging behind in terms of school quality or, or access to park or access to jobs. We're really trying to take a, a comprehensive approach to helping to shore up those neighborhoods. At the same time, we're trying to open up opportunities in other neighborhoods. And I, I do want to say that I, I think one of the, the sort of false dichotomies is that it's vouchers or investments in neighborhoods because the truth of the matter is we can give vouchers to people all day long, but if there aren't places for them to spend those vouchers in higher opportunity neighborhoods, then um, we're really not providing um, the kind of choice that we say we are. And so that's why I think the, the housing plan makes such a strong commitment to using tools that get affordable units built in every neighborhood of the city, whether it's 
voluntary inclusionary, mandatory inclusionary that we'll be coming out with soon, or the 421A program, which makes a very decided and controversial choice that we are going to require affordable housing in every neighborhood that gets the tax incentive. We're not going to allow some, uh, some things to be built off-site or uh, some people to not build at all, that every neighborhood has to have affordable housing built in that neighborhood so that people do have choices to move into those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Great, thank um, Yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated uh, sort of issue of sort of how do you make place work for, uh, for all families. Um, Kathy, I think this is a, I mean, certainly you're place-based, right? You have, uh, you have properties that are in specific places, so, and I know this is a part of the next gen. How do you make place work for folks? Well, on, on the <coughs> um, issue of housing choice and mobility, I think everyone's already kind of mentioned the, the New York market, although I have worked in other cities where mobility choice is more available, but it, it has a lot to do with the market is more diverse. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of us who, who manage voucher programs, particularly in this market, know that we're just fighting to, to get units available for, to house people, forget choice. And there's a, a HUD indicator where we're measured on how many families per year can we assist to move into a low poverty neighborhood, and we didn't make it last year. We couldn't, we can't get folks into those markets. So I think some of the programs that um, are mentioned here parallel with Section 8 subsidy might open some of those new areas, whether it's through 50-50 um, affordability programs uh, and a Section 8 subsidy through project-based might actually open some opportunities to enable families to move into those um, low poverty markets. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, per perhaps is, uh, supportive housing is instructive, perhaps not, you know, in, in this discussion. I mean, in supportive housing, we aggregate, I don't, not segregate, but aggregate, um, you know, uh, folks who have, you know, significant disadvantage um, and, and then provide services um, uh, to them to help them integrate within communities and, and basically to succeed, to create opportunity for them. Um, uh, in, I don't know, is, is there a corollary? Is there w some thoughts on that or sort of a, as an approach um, uh, as well? Any, anyone want to open question? I mean, I, I think that there's, that there is definitely a, um, a, a positive approach that, that there is plenty of evidence of, uh, whether you're talking about supportive housing. I mean, we've certainly, in talking, since we've had such a focus on veterans housing, um, there's a lot of data that shows that you're gonna be more successful uh, bringing veterans back into full society if they're together, because there's a lot of shared experiences that they've gone through. They tend to take to the social services programs better if they're living with other folks that are similar position, had similar experiences. Um, I think there there is an argument to be made for that. Um, of course, the interesting thing in uh, supportive housing is with the Olmstead, there's, there's this movement to say that Oh, too much uh, aggregation is not a good thing. And again, I think all of these kind of social, government social policies are really complicated. And um, I think you can, you can argue both sides of the argument and probably find a lot of anecdotal evidence that supports both sides. <coughs> Any of the other panelists uh, want to add some? Well, I think this is one of the reasons why we're excited about uh, this shelter and permanent housing model combined in, into one project. I mean, we're, we'll, we'll see how, um, how that uh, works out in practice, but as I said, we're closing the first of those projects, uh, certainly in, in our June closing cycle, and, but that's part of the idea behind that, and mm -hmm. so, so we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. okay. So Rich, I've sort of left you quiet, which is, <laughs> which is very <laughs> unusual, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but, but not forgotten. Um, so HPD, we sort of moved into supportive housing, and HDC has been in the forefront, I think, of helping to innovate new financing initiatives to accomplish, you know, not just, you know, broad uh, policy goals around 
supportive housing, but you know, broadly. Um, and uh, so maybe you could sort of uh, talk about some of the things that you've been involved with in terms of Medicaid redesign and MRT and financing shelter and right. things like that. And, 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 and senior housing as well, which obviously is a, is a form of, of, of supportive housing too. Um, I mean, part of, as I said earlier, is, is that we're all about trying to figure out how to put all the different resources together and the levering of that. And it gets complicated, as everyone who does development knows. Um, and part of what we're trying to do is figure out, you know, how to use tax-exempt bonds, whether it's uh, 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 private activity bonds that have come with the uh, LIHTC or, or 501c3, different kinds of, of bonds uh, as a, a method to bring the financing together, to use the other resources that can come in, um, the other government resources, whether it's Section 8 or the, in the case of MRT or money from DHS, it's all these different sources, and we try to get more comfortable with it. Um, a lot of the shelter type uh, world has been separate and has not really thought about you know, public finance and uni finance as a means to uh, get repairs done, um, to improve the quality. And so bringing these people together who haven't, who kind of have been in their own little boxes and sort of talking together has been really important for us to realize that we can lever that those resources in order to, to get the, the, the capital up front that allows you to build. So we, we really, I think, made a lot of progress in the last year, year and a half in that area, and I expect that we'll see more of that. And, and Vicki mentioned the project that will close this, um, this June, which um, has a, a shelter component that isn't being financed by HCC, and then a permanent housing that is, and that we're working more, you know, working better at integrating those pieces as we become more familiar, as we become more confident about the funding um, that's available there. And I, and I think we'll see more of that. I actually think that we'll see shelter financing being done by HTC directly rather than by the banks. Um, not that the banks can't play a role, and they probably will, but um, hopefully we can reduce the cost of capital. Going back to my earlier comments, I mean, we're all about trying to, you know, the lower the cost of capital, the more that can be done. It's all about more. So um, if we can do that, and, and that's what we're working towards. And it's an exciting time, and there will be some stumbles along the way because, as I said, we're not all used to working together in this way. And so as we learn how we all do things and we communicate and we can get more confident about that and then the market will get confident about it, we really can make a lot of progress. And, so, and, and I expect that we will. And we're willing to use our strength in that manner to kind of smooth out that process. Um, so it, it, it's exciting. So we'll, we'll see more of that. And, and I think we'll, um, and we look forward to working more with people um, in this room who are interested in that and, and sort of as we build the network, as it were. So I would say something that, um, that Rich mentioned before, um, I think passed a little bit unnoticed because it was early on, but um, it's very important, the sustainable bonds, the, the green bonds, I guess you call them, yeah. um, that you all are trying out. I know Gary Grazian told me that you're going to do mm -hmm. that. I'm really eager to find out how that, to see how that goes, clearly. A, because it's a model that we can certainly, no reason that HCR can't, or HFA can't do that. Um, uh, and so we'll see what the execution looks like. But you know, the, um, the, um, you know that model, and I, I don't know much of the details, but I assume that there is, um, the model is not to, you mentioned finding um, socially, you know, socially, mm -hmm. uh, socially conscious investors, but it's not to provide them with lower yields ultimately, it's simply to attract their attention to a different kind of product. Right, and, and in, as we have more investors, then right. by nature, the competition, it, right. it leads to us being able to sell the bonds at better rates. Right now, it's a little bit, it, you know, if, when you look at the big world picture, interest rates and grades, blah, 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 it gets a little daunting, um, and it's one of our concerns. It's always very frustrating when the world kind of blows up, just as you're doing a big yes. $700 billion deal. It's like, damn it! But um, hopefully, it'll I, work out. I have, I've been there. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but not at the head of a triple A rated um, entity, unfortunately, at the time. But it's, it, well, the reason I, f I focus on that is because there are, you know, that, um, the, the, no, the notion of doing that is very much in, t in tune with what we're talking about. You mentioned also MRT. It's also of a piece with that, which is, I think one of the ways that we're going to be able to find <coughs> this community is going to be able to squeeze more resources out of the stone over time is by finding other sources of savings, which are real. They're not made up, but we have to figure out how to quantify them. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of history with that now after several years of doing it, for example, in, um, in energy renewal, 
um, and energy savings projects where you know we go in and re-engineer. NYCHA has been a leader in this as has HUD. Re-engineer and audit um, audit buildings, um, identify savings, real savings from investment in upfront investment and in maintenance, um, you know energy savings, whatever else, and then um, capitalize those into uh, into a funding stream. It works. I mean, there's now a proven model for that, and the state does a lot of it up in um, some of our fellow agencies. Um, we've got to find models like that with other sources of savings. MRT is obviously the next iteration of this. Um, you know, you're going to see some of it in your green bonds, I suspect. It's going to get harder and harder to find. You know, the low-hanging fruit is getting picked off, but we've got to get sort of the financial world to understand that the savings are real. They just have to take a leap. Um, and, uh, and that's where I think we're going to get the real money to come into affordable housing and, and supportive housing. Great. Thanks. Um, and we're going to give Vicki an opportunity to abscond okay. from. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, my I don't want you to miss. Yes. Yes. I don't want you to miss the city council meeting. It's very important to all of us. Okay. Right? Um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Vicki. Kathy, I'd like to give you a chance to, because it's such a, uh, an amazing thing that you're doing in terms of uh, uh, leased housing and providing um, Section 8, project-based Section 8, to sort of talk about that. and. Um. Yeah, we've really embraced in the past two years really building um, our project-based program as a tool that developers can use to particularly meet the supportive housing needs of, of uh, residents in New York. And so towards that, and, and almost all of the projects that have been approved all have uh, an HPD uh, intersection. So we're very closely aligned um, from agency to agency. But we currently have 2,000 units that are already in our project-based program. And we've approved another 2,000 units that'll come online in the next three years. And those 2,000 coming online in the next three years are all supportive housing. They involve homeless, um, elderly. We just leased a project last year that was for patients being discharged from HH HHC facilities who were homeless that then got um, uh, subsidized housing. So we're really, uh, veterans we're using, in addition to the, these 2,000, we're also using our BASH funding to do some, uh, uh, some veteran housing. So we're trying to be very creative and trying to really listen to the community as far as what are those populations that need the support of housing model from a, from a rent subsidy side. Uh, and the other um, major um, challenge we have at NYCHA on the public housing side is our aging in place senior residents. So that population has just grown tremendously. And so we recognize you know, a need from the service side. And that's why one of our strategic goals is to transform our service aspects for, on the public housing side to attend better to our aging in place needs of um, residents. So that, that goal there is really to partner with community-based organizations um, to provide those services directly versus us trying to do it ourselves. Right. So um, through project basing and really um, new engagements with community-based um, service providers are the two ways that we're really trying to um, increase our response uh, for the supportive housing needs. Great, thank you. Um, you know, we've talked uh, throughout the morning about ending veterans homelessness. Um, and Holly, I just, uh, uh, sort of as a wrap up, maybe you could share some of what you think are sort of the lessons learned through that collaboration, because that's been a major collaboration of state, local, uh, and, and federal government. So. Sure, I mean, this is one of the few areas where there actually have been new dedicated federal resources, so that certainly has, has been a big uh, help. But I think um, in addition to that, the strategies have really, um, proven effective. I think one of the things that we've heard from the cities that have been most successful in ending their veterans' homelessness is a focus on what's called the housing first model, uh, which basically uh, focuses on prioritizing getting veterans into a home. So they may not have all of their other things that they need to be working on together yet, but just get them in a home. And what they've found um, is that other social services that are necessary uh, tend to stick better 
if that person has a stable home base. And so this has been used very effectively in a number of cities, um, and we're seeing that the ones that are getting closest to ending veterans' homelessness are, are embracing this model. Um, Actually, Binghamton, New York, was the first of the uh, towns around the country that uh, ended their veterans' homelessness earlier this year. New Orleans uh, was the first major city in Houston. Actually, the secretary just was there on Monday announcing that Houston has ended it. So uh, we are seeing, we're starting to see that this model really is paying off. Uh, another thing, as I mentioned earlier, is just really being sure you have to get into your data collection and actually go person by person. This is a hard thing that has not often been done at this level of detail before to basically be able to identify every homeless veteran. And that is why the VA is so critical because that's really the place that is most successful in drawing veterans in. A lot of veterans do not self-identify as veterans um, easily. And so that is a place where there is a support um, structure for them and so they do tend to come there and using the VA as a base to then coordinate with housing resources has been another critical element and so getting federal agencies to talk to each other and then our continuum of care partners which is, are the groups that we um, that we fund in order to do supportive services getting them hooked into um, these various sources has proven really successful a lot of this has been about better data and, co and coordinating among agencies with that data to make sure that no individual falls through the cracks. Great, thanks, Holly. So we, we have about 10 minutes, and I want to give you the chance to, you know, you have a captive, you know, sort of they have to answer your question sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'd like to take questions from you for the, for the panel. They don't have to answer them, but... Uh, <laughs> No question. Please. Yes, no. please. That's a good question. Um, Congress. Yeah. It's <laughs> 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 a good answer. Yeah. That is a good answer. Yeah. That is a good answer. Go out and vote. Yeah. Oh, for sure. There's still a nice body of. Uh, congressional people who try every year to actually make HUD go away. And I just, it blows my mind, particularly outside of New York City, when I go to towns upstate in New York or smaller cities in, in New Jersey. I mean, HUD money is the only game in town. And, it, and this, the fact that uh, there is not broad bipartisan support for a program like CDBG that often is the only way that infrastructure can get built, that a library can get built, forgetting about affordable housing for a second, kind of blows my mind and tells me that we need to be doing a better job of getting our message out about um, just how important our funding is to so many cities nationwide. Yeah, I agree. I would agree with that. I guess I would add, um, and I'm, I'm probably going to offend somebody in here, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that the press really always reflects perfectly um, the, the critical issues. Um, and I mean, listen, they've got a hard job, and they're in a dying industry, um, too. So you know, I get it. Um, but but the fact is, um, but the fact is that. Um, you know, the rush to the embarrassing story away from the difficult policy discussions um, is part of why we end up, I think, with, uh, with an elected, you know, with an elector, elected official group that doesn't really get the point. Um, it's, look, it's on our, it's on us to educate them, but they also have to report things. So I think that's part of the issue. And, and the thing I would add is, is that it's actually important for the advocate and the development community and, and all the different folks who are here. We have to communicate what we do and what we can accomplish very clearly and to get the message out consistently because that really does matter and people will hear that and people do like ribbon cuttings and all of that but beyond that there really is a positive story to tell about really the transformative effect that a lot of our work has um, and if we communicate that better then the, I mean whether there'll be you know there aren't that many happy stories in the paper so <laughs> it's, it's difficult but we can try to push it better so that people understand it more. Other questions? Any other questions? Yes, please.
continuation of that or not, whatever happens on June 17th, how that will kind of um, uh, drive the time that Okay. Um, I'll start and then I'll, I'll give it to Jamie. Uh, <laughs> 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 nice try. Uh, well, um, obviously, the I mean, the city's position is one where we're trying to extend uh, the uh, basically the tool that 421A is, and as Vicky said, to have a baseline of affordability built into it that today there really isn't. The most of the city um, has, as of right, tax exemption. Uh, built in if you're dealing with vacant land. Um, and that seems silly to us, and that there should be an opportunity to create a baseline of affordability in all neighborhoods if you're going to get that tax exemption. Uh, and so that is, um, it's, it's an important point and one that um, the mayor is advocating and, and the whole housing uh, group is, is working towards. Um, as people know, uh, 421A is a state law and it's subject to the legislature and so, uh, and there's a lot of discussion going on and uh, we're, we're hoping that people will advocate and will sort of see what we're trying to accomplish uh, with the plan. Um, there are multiple sides to this issue, obviously, um, and we'll, we'll, you know, if, if it's the status quo, I think that's unfortunate. It's a lost opportunity to get more affordability in more neighborhoods. Uh, and as I said, it, it, the idea is sort of a minimum baseline that requires, in essence, that all projects will have a regulatory agreement. You know, right now, as I said, there's a big area that has as of right, and, and that seems to us a wasted opportunity. So, um, <laughs> I don't really have any particularly strong views about this, but I guess I would say, um, you know, it's, it's very complicated. Um, a couple of observations as somebody who's really not involved in this discussion yet. Um, one, um, uh, I, I don't think I really would disagree with anything that Rich has said about the, the goals of what the mayor, I mean, I think the mayor actually put out, put out a pretty thoughtful plan. Um, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, which has led us into the discussion now. Um, um, if we had the time and the luxury of being able to do this with a thoughtful legislature and all that stuff, um, I think we'd all probably want to do what I, I think the governor sort of, at least between the lines, has been saying when he talks about 421 publicly, which is, let's really look at what this program is. I mean, this program, uh, you know, I don't know if I was even born at the time, but this program came up as a result. It had nothing to do with affordable housing. It had to do with, re you know, reinvigorating New York City. Um, and it led to the creation of lots and lots of, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of housing that, again, had nothing to do with affordability. It's been, um, you know, clever people have, have seen it as a tool to increase the affordab affordability stock over time, which is great, but it's not the world's most efficient way to do that. Um, cost the city a gigantic amount of money every year um, and it's going to cost the city a lot more money every year. So I think if we had the luxury of being able to sort of re-examine what our goals were, whether the, something like 421 is really the way to get to the end that we're trying to achieve, I suspect we'd say no and let's find something different to do. Maybe get rid of 421 as a, as a whole and move all of those resources into something else. The only other thing I would say is, um, and that's just like if we were in fantasy land, which I know we don't live there. The only, um, the only other thing I would say is I hope that whatever happens um, in two weeks' time, um, uh, I hope that what we're going to do is somebody's going to take, a, and somebody like the Furman Center or whatever, is going to monitor very, very closely what actually happens with whatever it is that we end up doing. Because I think, unfortunately, there is a lot of, on all ends, so what it costs the city, not as an all-in cost, not just the tax expenditure, but the various subsidies that have to get plot, plot into each affordable unit. Um, you know, depending on how much, how deep the affordability goes in whatever gets adopted. So, you know, we need to know what everything really costs um, because, as Holly said many times, basically everything's a trade off. You know, that money's got to come from somewhere. Um, and if it costs X dollars to put up, you know, to build an affordable unit under a 421A plan, we need to know how to compare that to what it's going to cost to build an affordable unit in the same area under some other me methodology and how much we're actually creating. So let's, you know, let's start at zero and see what it really, what really happens, full transparency. And I would just throw out that um, even though this has nothing to do with the feds, it's <laughs> sort of fun to sit on the right. sidelines yes. and watch other people argue about their programs. Um, it, I think from a personal perspective of having worked 
in the past in the city's affordable housing. It would be great to see 421A cleaned up, and I think there's a lot of areas to make it tighter. Um, but on the other hand, the vast majority of affordable housing has nothing to do with 421A. So there is a little bit of a huge debate going on as though this is the be all end all of the future of affordable housing, which is, I think, a bit of a red herring. And, and I think that's fair, Holly, but I would add that one of the things that we're concerned about is, is that there are a lot of neighborhoods that at one point were low income that are no longer. And, and one of the things that we're trying to do is lock in affordability in neighborhoods that are transforming. And, and so I agree with you that historically most of what we're doing is, I mean, to be honest with you, 421A is hard to use with affordable housing because it turns out too early. So you're, you're totally right about that. But by trying to create sort of this baseline, um, we really are dealing with uh, the fact that New York changes. And if we don't lock in units, that's the problem, and that's what we try to address. However, late or other issues that may be <laughs> relating to it, that's what we were trying to address with this proposal. And you know, and it was meant to be kind of you know moderate, not I mean, it, but but with some real beef to it. We'll see. Uh, just one more question, John. Generally, or, or well, specifically, uh, is there an effort to? You know, you haven't built any uh, developments in, in Queens. There's almost nothing in Staten Island. So you've restricted where it can be built to certain neighborhoods simply because you can't buy the land in the other places. <laughs> and is there any effort to, to compensate for that and, and buy land a little higher in other neighborhoods? Well, I think there are different opportunities um, that. Can, can happen, and where there is city land, there are different ways to look at things, so that, for instance, at, um, at Hunter's Point, the last RFP that was done has a senior component. So there are different things that can be done, and, and I, I hear you, though, I think we have to do more um, with respect to that. Um, you know, the, the, the good news is that there's a lot of history now that shows that this works, and that it actually fits in in neighborhoods and doesn't cause um, a lot of, of uh, structural problems that people were afraid of when we first started doing um, a lot of, of um, supportive housing. So I, I think we just have to keep on pushing. Um, as far as cost, uh, supportive housing is, is more expensive anyway uh, for a variety of reasons and ends up being very dependent. We use a lot of our federal resources for it uh, because it is more expensive uh, and, and it's sort of, it's the way things work. But um, you know, the, there, is, there are always tipping points and there are the trade-offs that have to occur. But I, I think we continue to be open to those opportunities and try to do the best we can. And partly it's dependent on our partners who try Absolutely. to be creative and try to be responsive as well. And especially ones that are in neighborhoods so that they can build the neighborhood support so that we can move that forward. It's hard to kind of come in with a group that isn't based in a neighborhood and say, well, this, we should be here. So it, it, it's I, an I just to dovetail on that, I think it is incumbent on the developers and owners of successful supportive housing to target um, not just the elected officials in neighborhoods that they want to build, but look at the records of elected officials that fight those developments in their communities. I'll just throw one out in my own community, Jeff Klein, who killed a supportive housing project in Riverdale. Um, mm -hmm. and show those folks how it works when it's done well. I think that is a vital thing to do. Or in my case, you can scream at Jeff Klein on a street corner when he's campaigning. Um, <laughs> but I think that is vital that they see how this works in a, in a good way. Uh, thank you all. And uh, yeah, huge round of applause for our, for our panelists.